morning. I'd like to join in the thanks to Dr. Sackler and Dr. Kunza and all of their colleagues here at Phillips Universitat. It's an honor to be part of these proceedings. I wish to make a historical presentation that considers Lemkin and Nuremberg in the context of the many fathers who truly are part of the process that produces the Genocide Convention. There is, of course, a Raphael Lemkin-centric story of the Genocide Convention. We've already been discussing it. It is a one-man dream realized. The chronology begins with his legal practice and his experience as a young man in Poland, his early proposals, including Madrid in 1933, his 1939 flight to the United States, academic work, loss of family, writing, his coinage of the word genocide, his 1944 book, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, his 1945 work on Justice Robert H. Jackson's United States staff at Nuremberg for the International Military Tribunal, the 1946 IMT judgment that does not employ the word genocide and indeed rejects the idea of crimes against humanity, count four, existing outside the context of waging aggressive war. Then Lemkin drafting in frustration but ultimately with success the Genocide Convention, the UN General Assembly adoption of it in December of 1948, and not more than a decade later, Lemkin's death, a broken man, largely forgotten, obscure and impoverished, but leaving in international law that word, the word that defines, to quote our conference reader, the worst of all international crimes, the word that may be the most potent word in the world's moral vocabulary. That is the Lemkin-centric account. I'll propose gently and certainly in a laudatory way, that that is based in thin historical literature that is more rhetorical than real. In part, the problem begins with Lemkin's own sparse paper trail. There's not much left of Raphael Lemkin, particularly his autobiographical fragments, never completed or published as a book, existing in various archives, the New York Public Library and elsewhere, are of thin and questionable reliability. There is insufficient scholarly digging that has occurred I think, to find elsewhere evidence of this man's actual locations and actual works. Not the myth or the ghost or the name of Raphael Lemkin, but days and places and jobs and documents and work. There is instead a tendency in historical writing and journalism to look back very proudly on the Genocide Convention as a no-brainer, plainly laudable, and to regard Lemkin through a hero model of storytelling as the person to celebrate and then we repeat such versions. There are exceptions, of course. Uh, I don't mean to paint with too broad a brush. Uh, Professor Matthew Lipman, who's already been mentioned, has written very detailed empirical descriptions of the drafting of the 1948 Convention. Samantha Power's own deservedly prize-winning book, A Problem from Hell, which is a thick discussion of modern genocide, is quite, I think, self-consciously and modestly thin on Raphael Lemkin. She talks about how Lemkin is a project she perhaps will still do at some point, biographically. But there is not so much Lemkin, and she doesn't pretend otherwise. There's also a historical tendency to look at the concept and the development of genocide and law in isolation from the problem and history and law, especially in the late 1940s, of other supreme international tensions, facts, context, and crimes including the crime of waging aggressive war. This gathering, this anniversary phase of study, and I call it a phase because December 2008 is the 60th anniversary of the General Assembly passage, and October 2010 will be the 60th anniversary of the Genocide Convention entering into force due to sufficient state ratifications. This anniversary moment, I think, is an opportunity to find and teach better history to weave those concepts and their many fathers, and of course, not to be sexist, I will include mothers, but it's a historical reality that we're talking mostly about men, back together, and through that, to have a more informed, wiser, and productive process of historical and contemporary discourse. Uh, I will add, uh, with considerable credit, that both of my predecessors on this panel, Dr. Chavez and Dr. Biffler, have begun and do the project that I am here advocating. So let me turn to the truer version, the many fathers version of the Genocide Convention. 
It begins, of course, it has, as has been noted, with Lemkin's word, his book, his visibility in the book, and its readership. And then I think the place to take it and really understand it and try to locate it and him is Nuremberg. And I will take this chronologically in a, in a series of places. Nuremberg begins in the United States. It begins in the War Department. It begins through the detailed drafting and proposal work of Colonel Murray Bernays, the Secretary of War Henry Stimson, the Under Secretary of War Robert Patterson, the Assistant Secretary of War John J. McCloy. Also outside the War Department, I think it's fair to say that Nuremberg begins with Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. It includes the work of Attorney General Francis Biddle, of Secretary of State Edward Statinius, of Judge Samuel Rosenman, of the United, United Kingdom's Lord Chancellor John Simon, and of course, in April of 1945, the new president, Harry Truman. Its core concepts are two. One is that Nazi aggressive war making was, is, an international crime. The crime of Nuremberg, the purpose of Nuremberg, is the crime of aggressive war. And two, that individual leaders who participated in the common plan and conspiracy to wage aggressive war were subject to international prosecution as major war criminals. Aggressive war making and conspiracy and agreement by leadership creating criminal culpability. Lemkin, as all of this is rising and coalescing in 44 and 45, is in ambiguous status a War Department consultant. It is actually most unclear whether he had an office, whether he had a paycheck, whether he had a title, whether he had assignments, whether he had readership, whether he was actually making an impact in the War Department process. He was around, he was known, he wanted in, and his ideas propagated on the outside through the Carnegie Report, which is his book, are certainly part of it. But that doesn't quite mean Raphael Lemkin is the War Department as he was doing this. In May, May 2nd, 1945, President Truman publicly appoints Justice Robert H. Jackson to be the United States Chief of Counsel for the prosecution of major Nazi war criminals. It had begun in private weeks earlier, but that's when it becomes visible to the world, to Washington, to everyone reading newspapers in Washington, including Lemkin. And thus, two days later, he writes to Robert Jackson. I take the liberty, Mr. Justice, he writes, of sending you my article entitled Genocide in the current issue of Free World. It contains a statement by von Rundstedt in connection to specific acts and points to his responsibility as a major war criminal. Here's my genocide article, Indict von Rundstedt. Third, he says, my book, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, published three months ago, contains legal evidence of the war crimes. Here's stuff that may be useful to you. And then, and this is a recurring theme in the surviving Lem Lemkin correspondence, I would be delighted to present you with a copy of my book, but I discovered only today that the first printing is exhausted, and the second printing has been undertaken by Carnegie. I'm sure you can get one from the Library of the Supreme Court. In other words, the have my book, but I can't give you a book dimension of Lemkin. And in fact, Jackson read this letter. Because at the bottom of the letter is Robert Jackson's full evaluation of this valuable contribution to Mr. Lemkin. He wrote A-C-K-N, period, acknowledge. That is a note to his secretary, and he throws it into his outbox. And his secretary or someone ghost writes a very short four-line letter, which Jackson dutifully signs, and it goes to Lemkin two weeks later. My dear Mr. Lemkin, thank you for sending me your article, Genocide. I have read it and your book with interest, and I am glad you called them to my attention. Now, please, a grain of salt, because as one looks at how Robert Jackson was filling those days of enormous responsibility, both juggling the end of the Supreme Court term and gearing up for this major project which had a diplomatic prelude but then would be this major trial of international war criminals, I'm not quite sure he really read either Lemkin's article or Lemkin's book. Nonetheless, acknowledgement is there. Contact is there, at least a very general knowledge is there. And, to be fair, the records show that the Lemkin book was indeed checked out by Jackson from the Supreme Court Library and taken to Germany, because over a year later, he's still dealing with overdue notices from the library, which wants the book back. 
In August of 1945, the diplomatic phase on the road to Nuremberg concludes with the signing of the London Agreement and Charter, creating the Inter International Military Tribunal and defining its crimes, its procedures, and jurisdiction. And it has been noted that process included discussion in private that used the word genocide and an explicit recognition by Jackson of American segregation as a potential discriminatory reality that a broad concept uh, might well reach, and explicit pulling back on the part of all four countries from doing anything explicit about genocide in the London Agreement and Charter. It is not there. Lemkin is there in London in August 1945. He was invited over by Colonel Murray Bernays of the War Department, the staff lawyer and draftsman who really outlined the plan that Jackson takes as an assignment and carries forward and now has embodied in the Charter and will carry out at Nuremberg. Thus, Lemkin is on Jackson's staff. Again, it is very unclear what his line responsibilities are, whether he's got a paycheck, whether he's got housing, whether he's got anything other than Bernays having arranged, obviously, for him to get military flight passage to London. He doesn't show up again on rosters, on manifests, on hotel records, on payroll records. But correspondence shows he's there. One of the things he does in London is interact with the United Nations War Crimes Commission, which had been appointed during the war and was a fact-gathering preparatory entity anticipating prosecutions of war criminals in the war. A delicate thing that is happening during this time period is that Jackson and the Allied process are both consulting with and taking over from, but frankly not finding much of utility in that predecessor international effort. But Lemkin is touching base and speaking. And then very quickly Bernays departs. He's got both health problems and compatibility problems with the project and the rest of the staff. And so Lemkin's sponsor and his supervisor is gone, and Lemkin is still floating in London. This is a problem. Colonel Jeffrey Hodgson, affiliated with the American Embassy at Grosvenor, a major player during the American phase and a sort of liaison for Jackson to the ambassador and a, a regular Jackson consultant, <laughs> writes this memorandum, I'm, I'm sorry, speaks to Colonel James Donovan, who's the general counsel of the OSS, another key part of the Jackson team and effort. And the memorandum that Donovan then writes goes to Jackson's deputy, who effectively has succeeded Bernays. His name was Telford Taylor. So Hodgson talking to Donovan, Donovan writing to Taylor. And to finish the loop, Taylor forwarding the document to Jackson. Subject, Dr. Lemkin. The day before I left, writes Donovan, I talked at our movie showing, capturing not some footage, with Colonel Hodgson. Colonel Hodgson spoke to me about the activities of Dr. Lemkin in London, stating that A, Lemkin has been going around to see the members of the United Nations War Crimes Commission, a group which Colonel Hodgson has to handle with extreme diplomacy. Among the things he, Lemkin, has told them is of the tremendous amount of work which has been done by him and others, excellent evidence assembled in the JAG office, etc. Since the United States has never submitted any evidentiary material to the Allied Nations, such declarations and descriptions to the Commission place Hodgson in an embarrassing position on what has always been a troublesome problem for him with the Commission. B. At a luncheon with Lemkin and various members of the Commission to which Hodgson was invited, Lemkin expressed amazement that Hodgson had never distributed to every member of the United Nations Commission a copy of Lemkin's book. Later adding that if Colonel Hodgson would order them, he would be glad to autograph them. <laughs> Colonel Hodgson was, of course, compelled to agree and ordered such books from the War Department. C. Lemkin has contacted certain newspaper people and discussed our war crimes problems with them. In other words, diplomacy and governmental policy being discussed with media by some consultant or subordinate employee. D. Lemkin is a London pole on the wrong side of the political fence at this time. And his presence in London in his capacity, quote, as a member of Justice Jackson's staff, can only alienate most of the European representatives of countries seeking Russian friendship, in Hodgson's opinion. Then Donovan, having summarized Hodgson's brief against Lemkin, adds his own views. 
I would like to add, with respect to Lemkin, that the question of his employment was considered by OSS on several occasions, that each time it was generally agreed that it would not be desirable on the grounds of his inadequate scholarship, including his book, Axis Rule in Occupied Europe, better Polish scholars available, an emotional approach to problems, personality difficulties, etc. I should also like to add that I informed Colonel Bernays of the foregoing before he cabled from London for Lemkin to come. And he agreed that if Lemkin came, he would be his, Bernays, personal responsibility. This is being written at a time when Bernays has burned out and is now gone. So there's a real double I told you so quality. Donovan concludes, I'm sending you this information because I've been told that Dr. Lemkin is now under your supervision, Taylor, in London, and thought you would wish to know these facts. Colonel Hodgson's su sole suggestion was that the sooner that Lemkin is out of London, the more Colonel Hodgson will be pleased. Now that's one moment and one or two men's perspectives, but a phrase at least to consider is loose cannon. A next phase on this road to Nuremberg. Lemkin's word, genocide, and its role in Nuremberg. It has been noted that it was not in the London Agreement and Charter. And it also does not appear a year later in the IMT judgment at Nuremberg. But it does appear in the Nuremberg indictment. And the first international legal document containing the word genocide is that October 1945 four-nation indictment, subscribed to by 20 additional nations. How, however, did it come to be there? The simple truth, again, being blunt without meaning to be mean, is that it was a gift. The people writing the indictment had, Lem had Lemkin hanging around and pestering them. <laughs> These people included Benjamin Kaplan and Sidney Kaplan and Peter Calvo Caressi and Telford Taylor. And almost, I believe, as a price of getting him to go away, they gave him a sentence. They throw the definitional sentence, genocide, and the <coughs> specification, into count three of the indictment. Why is that significant? Because count three is war crimes, not aggressive war. I'm sorry, not crimes against humanity. It is the actual, closer to the core concept of what Nuremberg was about, and they give Lemkin his word and his definition in there, specifying that the Nazis in the occupied lands as many of their war crimes, committed genocide against local populations. At the trial itself, genocide also appears. It appears verbally and orally on November 20th when that indictment is read on the first day of the trial. The voice of genocide for the world community is someone I believe you've never heard of, an assistant French prosecutor named Pierre Mournier, because he read count three to the tribunal on that day, including the Lemkin sentence that the London draftsman had given him. And interestingly, after lunch, although it's not specified a second time in that place, an assistant Soviet prosecutor named J.A. Ozel, when reading the Nazi crimes in the occupied Russian Republic, Soviet republics, added the genocide sentence to his presentation as part of the oral introduction. So twice, in the day that starts the Nuremberg trial is Lemkin's word. It's then not uttered again until June of 1946, when David Maxwell Fife, the British deputy prosecutor, but truly the principal British prosecutor, uses it in his cross-examination of Admiral Rader, one of the defendants, when reading to Rader a memo he wrote about Germanizing Czechoslovakia. And indeed, not only does Maxwell Fife use the word genocide, he mentions Lemkin's name when using it in question. And then a month later, the British chief prosecutor, Sir Hartley Shawcross, having made one of his occasional brief visits to Nuremberg, used the word genocide during his closing argument. Crimes Against Humanity, by contrast, is thickly, of course, part of the Nuremberg trial. It is part of early United States proof, including crimes against the Jews that are highlighted in Jackson's opening statement, including in the cases that were prepared by many, including Bernard Meltzer, an American lawyer with help from Rabbi Jacob Robinson of the World Jewish Council, and presented by United States attorneys at the podium, Sidney Alderman and William F. Walsh and many others throughout the conspiracy case, and also in the cases that later prosecutors presented against the individual defendants, including Whitney Harris's case presented in January 1946 against Ernst Kaltenberger, 
crimes against humanity pervades that. And of course, <coughs> carries through as part of the convictions and the judgment that the tribunal renders. Thus the complexity. Genocide, the word literally is in count three, and it is conceptually, if not literally, in count four. On September 30, 1946, the IMT renders its judgment. As I've said, genocide, the word is not mentioned. Aggressive war, the principal theory and point of the Nuremberg Project, is now successfully rendered a crime in the verdict of the tribunal. Crimes against humanity is also adjudged to be an international crime, and convictions are returned. But crimes against humanity, conceptually, is arguably set back by the tribunal folding the separateness of crimes against humanity into count three in terms of war waging, rather than leaving crimes against humanity as not limited to the context of war. Thus was Nuremberg, from the pr perspective of a genocide conceptual advocate or crimes against humanity theorist a success or a setback? Well, it was mixed and it set up multiple and alternative paths for future work. Let me briefly touch on was Lemkin at Nuremberg? Yes. How much? Doing what? Unclear. Not a roster personnel member, not on payroll, not assigned office space, not clearly residing in the Grand Hotel. In the summer of 1946, he is demonstrably in Paris. What's he doing there? He's agitating at the peace conference. I assume trying to get genocide into that official document. He is back, I think, in October 1946, as Henry King recalls, from the discussions of the IMT judgment in the lobby of the Grand Hotel. But I suspect he was mostly based in London and mostly working on the British during that Nuremberg trial year. And a manifestation of that is the Maxwell Fife and then the Shaw Cross uses of his words. So let's leave Nuremberg and move forward. What becomes of aggressive war and genocide at the United Nations? I think of one as the concept standing in the wind, the strong wind against the idea of making aggressive war making forever against everyone, a universal crime, and the other concept perhaps standing in the lee, in the shade, a bit protected. This notion of call it genocide, call it crimes against humanity, limited to wartime, make it a, a matter more generally, also being defined. The Nuremberg alumni take different positions. Jackson himself viewed all of Nuremberg, the London Agreement through the trial process and the judgments, and particularly the, the core concepts that I've discussed, as now precedent, done and established by the end of the Nuremberg trial in a common law sense for future episodes to reach and use and grow because it had happened and it had been done successfully in Nuremberg. Jackson was not an advocate of codification, largely because he was deeply pragmatic and concerned about both the political fragility of the United Nations and the likely complexities of getting a global international vote through the United Nations codifying the Nuremberg definitions. Francis Biddle, the American judge at Nuremberg, by contrast, called in his final report for, to Harry Truman for the United Nations to codify the Nuremberg judgment, Biddle's judgment. Shaw process has been noted, at least briefly, before the Foreign Office was heard from, called for United, United Nations codification of the crime against humanity that the IMT had stopped short of recognizing. And then political realities take over. Dealing with the anti-Soviet early Cold War context and tensions is, at least for the Americans, a big part of that fall 1946 and forward United Nations context. And the people wrestling with these codification or not and then once it starts, how codification will be supported and succeed projects, include Jackson, include Charles Fay, who was the chief American military advisor in Berlin during the Nuremberg trial and is now the chief legal advisor of the United Nations. It includes Dean Acheson from the State Department and many others. And their concerns are the possibilities of rejection, media work, diplomatic complexities, etc. Nuremberg's primary concept, aggressive war, is the topic of committee work at the United Nations and fitful progress. Genocide, similarly, is a topic of committee work and fitful progress. The irony is that at Lake Success, what a beautiful name, they eventually produced by December of 1946 
General Assembly votes that arguably do both. The General Assembly votes in December to accept the Nuremberg Charter and Judgment. Notice indictment is skipped over. But somewhere in there is a lot of the idea of crimes against humanity, and plainly in there is the idea of aggressive war. And then, of course, 1947 and 1948 begins with fits and starts. I'll give you one glimpse of the Nuremberg-Jackson-Lemkin thread during that next process. Jackson's executive assistant at Nuremberg was his own son, William Jackson, then a 26-year-old lawyer. Two years later, he's a young associate at a large Manhattan law firm, Milbank, Tweed, Hope, and Hadley. And his phone rings on the morning of August 11, 1947. As he writes later that day, a letter, Dear Dad, to Washington, a strange voice came on the telephone, and it turned out to be Dr. Lemkin, who is now a sort of part-time expert consultant to the UN, chiefly on the draft convention of genocide. I could ne never quite figure the bugger out when he was in London and then Nuremberg, but today we had common cause. He wanted to talk about the hash being made of the codification proposal by the UN committee. And then they discuss an article that Bill Jackson has just published in Foreign Affairs. And then they agree to have lunch, and they do that day have lunch. And at the lunch they discuss concerns about the former French chief judge at Nuremberg, Donadieu Duval, who is now very involved in this codification process. As Bill Jackson writes his, to his dad, Lemkin says Debob was the chief factor in watering down the judgment on crimes against humanity. According to him, Debob is a reactionary, German-minded theorist, a sort of intellectual sympathizer with the Nazis. Lemkin points to the fact that Debob has been an official visitor to Nazi Germany at the invitation of Hans Frank, some international law association, I suppose, that he remained in Paris during the occupation and somehow managed to publish a 700-page book in 1943 when paper was scarce and controlled by the Germans. Lemkin further says that he was only, to Bob, a narrow-gauge professor who was appointed judge at Nuremberg through the influence of his son, who at the time was a political aide to de Gaulle. This is rather invidious stuff, Bill Jackson writes, with sources not identified, but I would be willing to accept quite a bit of it from watching the old fool, de Bob, in action at Nuremberg. They also discuss codification, the UN process. And Bill Jackson reports that Lemkin opposes United Nations codification of the crime of aggressive war. He discusses who's on which side and explains that the Russians are for it. While they're slowly swallowing Europe, they want a law against military opposition. And their internal propaganda screams that the US is planning an aggressive war and they would like to fashion a code against us for future propaganda purposes. And finally, they discuss Justice Jackson. Lemkin wants Justice Jackson to head off opposition to the Genocide Convention and head off opposition to the codification of aggressive war. So he's sort of enlisting in Jackson's to help his own agenda. And Bill Jackson gives his father a heads up that Lemkin could well be turning up on his doorstep in Washington. Now, what does this all show? It shows the human dimensions and some of the chaos and from the front side some of the unpredictability. I'll close with one more piece. There is practicality at Nuremberg. It's fully correct to criticize it for only doing what it did and stopping short of more, just as the Apollo program did not reach Mars. But part of the practicality is involved in more than the theorizing and the codifying, and it's about the doing. And I think it's captured in an interesting exchange that I luckily discovered in an archive. In July 1947, a lawyer on the staff of General Lucius Clay in Berlin, Whitney Harris, writes to his old boss, Robert Jackson, now back at the Supreme Court, Nuremberg alumni. And Whitney Harris writes that he has attended in Paris an international law conference, that Telford Taylor was there from Nuremberg, that Devab was a principal participant, that Devab had introduced a resolution calling for the establishment of a permanent international penal tribunal having jurisdiction with respect to crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. All of it. Harris writes to Jackson, this resolution seemed to me considerably too broad to have any practical significance. And this is what Jackson writes back. 
to Whitney Harris, whom he had very high regard for, based on their work together in Nuremberg. I'm glad that you attended the International Conference on Penal Law, although I am frankly afraid of most of those doctrinaire fellows. They seem to think they have accomplished a great reform when they have adopted a resolution that nobody ever reads and that doesn't get published outside of their own journals. And while they get up resolutions that sound as pious as an endorsement of mother, home, and heaven, they are mighty little help when it comes to something like the problems that you now face in Berlin and that we faced in planning and carrying out the Nuremberg trial. The best thing about most of those fellows, wrote Jackson, is that nobody takes them too seriously. I think it's fair to say, stepping back from that pungent paragraph, that Jackson and Lemkin and many, many others were at varying times both kinds of fellows. They both resolved and planned and codified and engaged in rhetorical exercises, and they both, in moments, carried out real things. This anniversary and the complex history of the Genocide Convention and Raphael Lemkin in thick context remind us, I hope, remind us, who very easily could be the former types of fellows, also to be the latter, to really get things done.